going on world welcome to another episode of insightful principles uh this is episode 54 and thank you all for watching this video if you could please like subscribe and share this video that would be greatly appreciated and within this episode i want to discuss black wall street and exactly what black wall street was was black owned businesses back in 1921 in tulsa oklahoma it was a big thriving community called greenwood district and within this community you had businesses you had hospitals uh you had so much growing real estate um where there were a lot of uh black entrepreneurs now what was so tragic about what happened in 1921 is called the tulsa race massacre and this week marked the 100 year anniversary uh, of Black Wall Street being destroyed um, back during that time in 1921. And, you know, I think that since then we have made within a black community a lot of great strides. And there's tons of more black entrepreneurs that are starting their own businesses that are into real estate that are you know investors so we have came a long way but i did want to highlight what happened during those times and just go into details of the economic costs of what happened in 1921 and how we still are dealing with that wealth gap that i have spoken before in many of my previous episodes so for those of you that may not know what the Tulsa Race Massacre was, um, it was one of the most worst incidents of racial violence in U.S. history. Um, it occurred over an 18-hour span, and it started on May 31st, and it lasted all the way to June 1st of 1921. And what happened specifically was there was a white mob that destroyed businesses, homes, residents in a predominantly black neighborhood uh, specifically it was called greenwood district in tulsa oklahoma now the greenwood district was known for being called the black wall street because there were so many thriving businesses where there was a lot of equity within that community now during that time the city was driven by oil money which it allowed it to become a growing and a prosperous city and it had a population of more than 100,000 people, but it also was a tightly segregated city where many blacks experienced racism and violence. And 10,000 uh, were black residents that lived in Greenwood. And it was, uh, it was, it was definitely a, a tough time um, during, those, during those moments. And Greenwood District was known for being one of the most wealthiest districts in all of Tulsa. So it was a definitely uh, a thriving and a prosperous uh, community. Now, many news outlets describe the cause of Tulsa massacre was the result of rumors of a young black teenager um, assaulting a young white elevator operator. And this rumor was then displayed on a Tulsa uh, Tribune front page story which eventually led to a group of white Tulsans committing numerous acts of violence against black people. And then on June 1st, uh, many white residents entered into the Greenwood district area and they began to loot. Um, they, and they burned many homes and businesses for over 35 city blocks, which that was a lot of territory of damage that they did. And now firefighters even attempted to help black residents during this race massacre in 1921 but white residents ended up driving out the firefighters by threatening them with their guns now there were records of 1256 houses burned and 215 other homes were looted but they weren't burned down now the aftermath of the tulsa race massacre led to millions of wealth being destroyed in the midst of 18 hours the young black teenager was falsely accused and he wasn't guilty of doing anything. What other outlets have mentioned was when that first went down, uh, when the young black teenager was falsely accused, they, uh, the person had been convicted of charges of assault. But then immediately after the massacre, 
they dropped the charges and they said that the teenager, the black teenager, didn't do anything um, to the young white uh, woman uh, that was, you know, inside of the elevator. So I thought that was crazy that that the situation escalated so much to the point where that much property had to be destroyed all off of a false accusation. But back in those times, you know, racism was running very rampant and it didn't take much for a situation like this to be escalated. Now, the Tulsa Race Riot Commission concluded that between 100 and 300 people were killed and more than um, 8,000 people became homeless. And, and in the following years, uh, black Tulsans, they tried to rebuild their homes, um, their businesses that were ruined. However, segregation only increased and it became even harder to acquire black ownership in the Tulsa areas. And there also was a big news blackout where police and state militia archives didn't mention this at all. It wasn't even discussed in history books or even taught in schools. So this just goes to show you that they really didn't want the history of this to be put out because it was so, it was just so crazy and it was unfortunate that uh, this amount of wealth was destroyed um, in the black community and it definitely were tremendous economic impacts even moving forward after that point. Now, according to a 2001 report by the Oklahoma Commission to, that studied the Tulsa race riot of 1921, Greenwood residents went on to file over $1.8 million uh, in damage claims. And in today's dollars, that would be $27 million. All of the claims were denied. And another stat that is very shocking is that if 1,200 median price homes in Tulsa were eliminated today, the loss would be around $150 million. And I was able to uh, find this article. It was a 2018 article in the American Journal of Economics and Sociology estimating the financial impacts of the 1921 massacre. The article also mentioned that with the additional losses of other assets, including cash, personal belongings, and even commercial property, the total amount of wealth that was eliminated was close to over $200 million. So just really think about that. And, you know, it even today in the Tulsa community, in uh, a majority of the black neighborhoods, they are very limited to jobs in financial firms and institutions. During the Black Street Wall, black Wall Street era, there were many more opportunities than what they have available to them now. And even now, during uh, those, even within the Tulsa community now, there's less financial independence amongst the black communities and less participation of workers in black majority communities in financial institutions that direct capital flows. So it's very interesting when you really think, look into the history of this and look at how much it has impacted the Tulsa community now. And black people comprise 10% of the Tulsa metropolitan population. However, black owned businesses comprise only 1.25% of the area's nearly 20,000 businesses. That is very uh, shocking when, when I really uh, read that statistic. Black residents don't have much access to direct sources of capital investments and loans in the area. So this presents barriers as well for um, black entrepreneurs to create and expand the business as well as going to a bank to receive funding that could assist with building wealth. Now to put in perspective what could be bought today with the millions of dollars that were lost back in 1921, according to the Brookings Metro Analysis Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics data, $200 million could fully fund college education for 9,098 students for, for black residents attending the University of Tulsa, the University of Oklahoma, and Langston University. As you can see, the financial impacts of the Tulsa race massacre is very significant. It has affected many black residents in the past and currently has affected many of them now in, in those communities. 
And as a community, we cannot forget what happened to the Greenwood District during those times. And with this week, I wanted to reminisce and I wanted to really educate my viewers to understand what happened during those times and also wanted to explain that we can't change the destruction of the past, but we can come together as a community with group economics. We can encourage initiatives to provide capital investments for entrepreneurship and funding college education. We also can strategize, mobilize, and utilize our resources to help um, hire our own, being able to create black businesses, but being able to hire our own and really keep it in our ecosystem where we can really bridge the racial wealth gap. And I think that there needs to be more conversations about real estate ownership and, and really strategically looking at ways of how you can buy real estate amongst your family and use an FHA loan and buy a two to four unit building and be able to, you and a family member can live in one unit or they can live in their own unit and you rent out the others and just really building wealth amongst your, your black family. Um, and then also investing in the capital markets. I've said it before in on this channel, but investing in the stock market is, is very helpful and it allows you to be able to really build assets um, where you can invest in companies and you can be able to also create an LLC where you can be able to buy securities with your family and you can keep it all within that LLC. And that's another way that you can be able to build wealth with your family. Uh, I definitely think that also investing in the cryptocurrency market uh, with all of the innovations that I'm seeing with blockchain technology and how we will be moving more to a decentralized network where we're no longer going to need a third party. We're not going to need a bank to send money to our friends or our family. Everything is going to be decentralized where we will have more control of our financial services. We essentially will be our own bank. And I think that a lot of the initiatives within cryptocurrency, I'm very bullish on it. And I think that every person in the community, in a black community, should put a portion of their assets in the cryptocurrency market. And I think that all of these things will be great strategies and will allow us to really be able to, to help bridge that wealth gap and help combat some of those challenges that we still face here in the black community. So as always, if you all can please like, subscribe, and share this video, that would be greatly appreciated. I'm also still doing the giveaway where on episode 50, all you have to do is simply comment, like, and share uh, share this channel on your Instagram story. And I'm definitely um, going to uh, uh, announce a winner here very soon. I'm almost at the goal um, of the, the subscribers um, that I am working towards. But if you all can continue to keep uh, locking in with that, I would greatly appreciate it. There are a lot of people participating um, also, if you continue to support the Patreon page uh, where I create content um, all the way from budgeting, uh, being able to build your net worth, uh, financial planning. I have those one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls every month. I have some a great amount of people that have been uh, being involved with that. And also with my Discord channel um, where I'm able to be able to give different ideas with investing and being able to get you ahead of the curve uh, with looking at other opportunities in the market. So thank you all so much for tuning in to another episode of Insightful Principles and take care.